Check out YouTube channel Awesome Cameras featuring other film related YouTube channels. Go check him out after this video. If you like this video, please hit the subscribe button and the bell so you don't miss the next one. Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. I'm going to do a quick talk about the Nikon F90X which uh, is a camera that I love, it's uh, part of my collection and I don't shoot it as much as, uh, I wouldn't say I'd like to, but I don't shoot it as much as maybe I should. Um, I, can't, I kind of like my mechanical uh, SLR cameras and as I say I don't really shoot this camera much but it is a fantastic camera and I thought I'd get it out and do a quick talk about it. Um, especially for you guys that are starting to get into film and are looking for a, a, a decent, easy, reliable camera to use. This is a good one and I paid about 30 quid for this probably about six or seven or eight years ago, I can't remember now, but it's never failed me. Every time I've taken, a, every time I've loaded a roll of film in here, I've come back with great results. So it's, uh, it, I'd say it's a really good camera for, for starting out in film photography. So uh, let's get into showing you more about the Nikon F90X. A little bit about it, a little bit about its history and uh, some of the functions that it has to offer. So the Nikon F90X or the N90S as it's called in the States is a 35mm autofocus SLR camera which uses Nikon's F mount lens. In 1992 Nikon introduced the F90 and for the US market the N90. They were not quite as impressive looking or as big as Nikon's flagship the F4 and F5 and didn't have the interchangeable viewfinder. However, packed enough punch and features for Nikon to class the camera as high-end and focus sales towards the more serious amateur, although it didn't stop the professional taking advantage of its size and weight. At the time, the N90 had replaced Nikon's F801, which was called 8008 in the US market. The 801 SLR camera was first introduced in the late 80s and superseded the F501, which was called the 2020 in the US, which was Nikon's first successful autofocus camera. Before that you had the F301 where the look of the camera started to change shape from the classic look of those cameras from the 60s and 70s. In 1994 Nikon introduced the F90X which featured a faster autofocus system than any of its predecessors and brought it up to speed with Canon which at the time was winning the autofocus speed race. Even Nikon's professional F4 had a very slow autofocus compared to Canon's autofocus SLRs. As opposed to the F90, the F90X featured a more faster and accurate autofocus and shutter speed adjustments were made in thirds of a stop as opposed to the full stop increments on the F90. The frame burst rate was also increased and they got rid of that annoying beeping function. One thing that Nikon didn't upgrade which should have been upgraded was the rubber coating on the back of the camera. It was easily scratched off as seen in my example here and with heavy use of this camera it would soon start looking tatty. I've had this camera for many years and even though I don't find it as much fun to shoot as my mechanical SLRs I still enjoy using it now and again. Being all electrical I can rely on the accuracy of the shutter speeds and its quick and precise autofocus and metering system. So let's start by looking at the functions of the camera. Look at the top left hand side which you can see on this camera here. So the timer is uh, self explanatory, goes from 2 seconds all the way up to 30 seconds. You've also got this jog wheel here which uh, all, the, all the functions and you use this to go up and down the values. So there's 30 seconds, that's the timer. You've got the drive system which is um, for your shooting speeds. So I've got here single speed and you've got um, kind of semi fast and then you've got high which is just over 4 frames a second. I think 4 point something frames a second but uh, you can hear what it sounds like. And then the slower one and obviously single. So that's what the drive does. You've got your flash button here which offers you a rear curtain firing and a slow sync as well as a red eye reduction as well on the flash sync side. Um, you've got your mode which goes between aperture priority and also shutter priority. You've got manual and you've also got program mode as well. And on the program mode you've got some features on the back of the, you've got some um, examples on the back of the camera. But unfortunately with this camera the, the rubberized back seems to scratch off so 
you know, um, those icons are sitting on top of the rubber. So if that's all scratched off, you're not going to see the icons. So you might uh, want to refer to the manual if you've got a manual. If not, there's a manual online for it. And this is your ISO selector as well. So you've got your ISO speeds on this. And if you go all the way to the bottom, you've also got your DX coding for your film. So if you if you film, you can see the DX code here. You pop this 400 film inside the camera. You set the ISO to read the DX encoding here and the camera will automatically set the ISO to 400 speed. So it knows what film you've got inside the camera for its metering system, so you're gonna get good exposures, hopefully. So this little button here, you press that, that's your metering button. So you've got spot meter, you've got center weighted, and also 3D matrix as well. This little PS bug function here, that goes with the program. So if you're in program mode, and then you press PS, I don't understand what PS stands for, programs, something or other, I don't know. But you press that and it goes through your portrait, your landscape, um, backlit subjects and all that stuff. Okay, little tiny green dot is a reset button which works simultaneously with this green dot. So you press the two of them and the camera resets itself. Um, all the functions that you've changed, it will reset it, I think, to to, to the um, um, unbox settings, I suppose. Uh, let's look on the other side of the camera now. So you have got this lovely um, LCD display on this camera and when you press the light button, it illuminates really well so you can you know see everything that's going on inside there. When it's dark, here you've got your rewind button, which works simultaneously with this rewind button. It's like a fail safe, so when you press them both together, it rewinds a film. If you press one or the other, it won't do it. But when you're ready and you've shot your roll of film, you press them, press them both together and the camera rewinds it back inside the film canister. And on this side, you've also got your exposure compensation button as well for when you're shooting shutter priority or program or in um, aperture priority as well. And this little button here changes your focusing screen. So uh, through the viewfinder, when you're looking through, you can change the focusing from spot focusing to a wider focusing as well. There's your on-off button there. Slide it on and off. And there's your fire button as well. And you've got your hot shoot as well. Let's look at the front of the camera. But uh, the front of the camera, you've got um, a autofocus lock little button there while you're shooting. You press that and it, it will stop autofocusing and uh, you've got your depth of field preview there and your auto focus functions as well and this switch selects from manual focus to auto focus and then on to continuous servo focus as well here you've got your um, flash sync as well underneath that cap and that i haven't got a cap on that one that's for your shutter release cable and these little two switches here click on that oh and the back falls open if you to put your film inside so loading the camera is really easy to do. Just flip open the back of the camera, place the film inside. Right, so even trickier to do while it's while I'm trying to do this cack handed, showing you guys what I'm doing, but you just slide that little bit down there. Make sure that the uh, holes are lined up with the, whatever they're called in there. And that's it. So you close the back, hit the fire button and it advances the film the first frame and you're ready to shoot. So I've just set this little scene up here. This is a gazebo in my garden and if you're wondering why the roof's off it's been bloody windy lately so the whole thing's been rocking about but uh, I've tied all that up that's what that's about but um, I've got this straw stuff like kind of imitation bamboo cane looking stuff going all around it um, and I've put this black board, this bit of mount board just behind. I'm going to take a photograph of uh, just the tips of the bamboo cane and I'm using, uh, the only lens I've got for this camera is what it came with when the guy sold it to me which is a Sigma 28-135 to macro lens which is going to be quite handy because I want to get real close on these little bamboo bits here. So uh, I'm in manual mode, I'm not going to use the shutter priorities or the aperture priority stuff so I'm just going to take a picture of this in manual mode and uh, use the camera's metering system as well to do some metering. I'm only going to take a few shots Shots, cut the film out of the camera, develop it and show you guys um, the print afterwards. So I'll just do a quick metering on the tips of the uh, wood there, uh, spot metering on them. And for the 400 speed film I'm using, 
and at f8 it's giving me two hundredth of a second so I'm going to take that shot but I'm also going to go one stop under one stop over and uh, see what I get in the dark room okay here we go first shot that's one and we'll go one stop over uh, one stop over to one hundredth of a second and one stop under to four hundredth of a second it's just moving in and out so my focus is going in and out I don't want that there we go stop for a sec Okay, there's three shots. I'm going to take a few more different angles while I've got this set up. And the last three shots I'm going to do um, not macro. So uh, take the macro mode off and just do a nice little composition on the tip of these, whatever they're called. So most of my regular viewers would know that I always end up in the dark room after making a video. So here I am in the dark room and I'm going to make a print of the gazebo straw or bamboo or whatever's around it um, that I shot on the F90X that you saw earlier on. Now I did say that I was only going to shoot um, three frames and then come in the dark, or cut it out of the camera, come in the dark room, make a print. But uh, I ended up getting a bit too excited with the F90X and I went down to the local train station and shot the shit out of the rest of the film. Um, so here's the negatives here that I've developed in XTOL. I've got a contact sheet here as well on the wall that I already printed. That's a little bit underexposed, but that doesn't bother me. It's only a reference sheet um, just for me to see the images and what ones I want to print. But uh, yeah, I had some nice photographs from down the train station, but I'm going to be making a print of the little tiny bamboo shoots that I that you saw earlier on and this is the contact print here so you can see the straw ones that I took uh, like I say the contact sheet was um, a little bit overexposed but it, at least it gives me a reference guide to which images um, I'd like to print I ended up printing the telephone box uh, this one here but uh, let's work on the straw one that we were talking about and I'm going to be using um, my 16 by 12 Kentmere paper I like this paper it works quite well for me and um, I'm not going to be sizing it 16 by 12 I'm going to be sizing the print at uh, 10 by 10 which I've already made a mask for and an insert as well to make a little black border so I'll show you that as we go along so uh, it shouldn't be too long now to make this print just going to make a few test prints and, uh, and then get on with the uh, master print if you like and look at this you've all seen these before this is no ordinary light box this is a light box that I found for five pound in a shop and you put all the little letters on like the cinema thing and uh, I bought it into my darkroom so I can put my negatives on it's a bit of an upgrade from the sandwich box that I used to use so yeah I took all sorts of shots train tracks and signal lights and, and whatnot an old London telephone box that I found which I recently put on Instagram um, some street lights and um, stuff like that and you'll see this is the uh, cardboard easel that I've made or template for um, for my 10 by 10 square print and that's the insert that I've kept which is going to be giving me the border all the way around guys you've seen this before but I'm just showing this for any any newbie subscribers or any new viewers so the first thing I'm going to need to do is to make a test strip this is my little test strip machine that I'm going to use uh, again you've all, you've all seen this before I'll do test strips of uh, three seconds using that so let's get a little bit of paper on there my little focus finder out Put my bit of test strip paper inside. I'm just going to make my test strip now every four seconds. So, four. So I've finished uh, making a few tests, it only took me about 10 minutes to do, so uh, this is my first test strip, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20 and 24. I decided that 16 looked the best, so I went and did a print at 16, which is this one, not a print, uh, another test strip at 16, just on the bamboo. I kind of like the um, tones that I've got around it, so that was at 16, and then I did another test strip here, a little bit bigger. Um, and this was six, obviously 16 as well. So I'm going to go for an overall print of 16. Hopefully it will look all right. I've just um, dusted off the neg, put it back in the enlarger, so hopefully I won't get any dust spots on there. So uh, let's see. 
I'll cut the surplus off uh, here for a test strip for a rainy day. Bang the head on the enlarger and then just put some weights down on my template. Get these weights from a DIY store and they just stop any light leaking underneath the template while I'm enlarging. And the last thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to burn in the edges, just kind of give it a vignette look. Just so when you look at the print, you're kind of attracted more to the centre than, than the edges because it's quite um, uh, a flat lit print it will be, if you like, uh, a flat lit image. So I'm just going to just vignette the sides off a bit. There we go, like so. Okay, and the last thing to do is just to make my border, which I'll use the insert. Like so. Take the negative out and just burst white light onto it. And that's enough. Okay, so the print is sitting in a fix, and uh, I don't know if I've showed—I don't think I've shown this before on my channel. But someone emailed me and said, "Why don't you save space and tear your trays?" I thought it was a great idea, so that's exactly what I did. I've got my developer, my stop, and my fix in these large um, 20 by 16 trays, and just these shelf brackets that I balance the trays on. They ain't going anywhere. Um, fantastic idea! I can save loads of space that way. I never thought of that before. Normally, I'd have the trays all spooled out over here, but uh, doing it this way. Um, it's really saved me a load of space in the darkroom, something I never thought before, so um, it's a pretty cool idea. Anyway, uh, it's in the fix now, should be done. Well, I hope so, because I've turned the lights on. And there it is. There's only one tiny little dust spot I could see on the twig here, but that's not going to bother me at all, bearing in mind it's a black, um, a, a black print, if you like. Uh, done quite well to try and keep the dust off that one, so let's put it in the wash over here and give that a wash so I'm back from the dark room now and with me is that print that I made and I'm quite happy with it there's just one little tiny dust spot that picked up on one of the one of the twigs, bamboo shoots, whatever you call it. Um, you know, but that's not gonna bother me. It's very minute, you're not gonna see it. And I like the print that much. I'm gonna mount it and frame it and put it indoors somewhere. It's a nice print. So, um, you know, I'm not gonna let this one just sit in a box like the rest of my others. Um, and I also did a small 10 by eight print as well. And uh, it's a little less grainier because it's not as enlarged being a 400 speed film. When I enlarged it, I picked up quite a bit of grain on this one. But um, I don't mind the grain. Back to the camera. So that was my overview of the Nikon F90X. And you see me talking about it. I've learned a little bit of history about it from making this video as well. Um, and, you know, shooting it, it's a real easy camera to shoot. And I would definitely recommend it if you're starting out in film photography and you don't know, you know, what camera to buy. There's plenty of others out there. Of course, there is like your, your Canon AE1s and your Pentax K1000s and what have you. But this was my first... Um, film SLR camera and this is what catapulted me into shooting film um, you know and it hasn't served me at all bad in any way or shape or form um, it still works and I do like shooting it like I said don't shoot it as much as maybe I should but um, you know to put a roll of film in this camera and go out and, and just shoot the shit out of whatever I see it's quite good fun anyway guys I hope you liked the video uh, please subscribe give it a thumbs up share it with your mates and all that stuff and uh, I'll catch you next time If you like this video, please hit the subscribe button and the bell so you don't miss the next one.